Hey folks, I am Kevin Ioli, and uh, one of my favorite people in the world of MMA is a guy that has been the uh, voice of the UFC for a number of years right now. Little known fact, he also was the voice of Bellator for uh, at least a little uh, bit of time. So the two major organizations, my friend John Anik has been the play-by-play -play guy for. John, how are you? It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it was a highlight for me in 2003 with the Mouthpiece Boxing Show when I was a kid, essentially, when we got to interview Kevin Ioli for the first time. So we go way back, my man, and uh, different circumstances before our chat here today, obviously. Absolutely. It's kind of crazy. You know, we were talking before we turned the uh, recorder on uh, about, you know, going a little stir crazy during this uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, I talk to fighters, hey, what are you doing to, you know, do uh, get ready? As a broadcaster, what are you doing during this thing? Do you watch tape? Like, what do you do to kind of prepare yourself uh, as when you know Tony and Habib is coming up and at some point you're going to have to call that show? Right. So that's the fight that is on everyone's radar and certainly mine from a preparation standpoint. I don't like to get too far ahead of the prep because my memory is not steel trap like like Kenny Florian or Joe Rogan. So for me, especially in terms of my handwritten notes and my fighter cards, I don't want to do that too far out. But Kev, what we're dealing with here is essentially five fight cards that were scheduled from March 21st through April 25th. Any one of those fights, conceivably, given Dana's recent comments, could end up at UFC 249 on right. April 18th. So uh, I got all fight cards printed on my desk and uh, ready to go, ready to travel. I think for us, the biggest anxiety as commentators would be if it's like 17 or 18 fights because I try to give each of these athletes my time and 26, 28 fighters is about my limit. But uh, we're all itching to get back to work. And I think uh, given Dana's uh, appetite to make this fight happen. I think the staffers are all behind him and, and want to try to get ourselves wherever this fight is going to take place. I hadn't thought about uh, that many fights on a show or doing maybe 18 fights on a show. That's, that's a good point. I wonder, would you be comfortable if they went to you and said, hey, we're going to do 18 fights on the show, but we're going to have Brendan Fitzgerald do six of them and you do 12 of them, something like that. Would that be something you would like? Absolutely. You know, I know back in the day they had talked about doing for International Fight Week three broadcast teams for the 13 or 14 fights. You know, John Gooden and Dan Hardy start us off and then you end with the pay-per-view team. So I'm receptive to anything. You know, I'm not blind to the fact that I might be flying to Las Vegas, Kev, and uh, be there for a month doing right. shows every three or four days. I think 12 or 13 fights every every few days is more manageable for me, selfishly from a preparation standpoint. But when I think about what these fighters are going through from a weight cutting standpoint, from an unknown standpoint in terms of if their fight is going to happen, how hard should I go? Who can I even train with? Um, I can certainly do my part and be prepared to call those fights if and when they do happen. Exactly. And I, and I imagine that is really what are we going to see? Is the MMA going to be the high quality MMA that we've come to expect from the UFC or because, like you say, you know, um, what is it? What can we expect from the fighters? I mean, that I think Tony and Habib have been training for so long that, and they're such elite fighters that you know from them. But from other people on the card who maybe haven't reached that level, what kind of MMA are we going to see? It's a great question. I haven't heard it posed all that often. It certainly depends on each case. I think the buzzword that I've heard is cardio, right? That's something you can control, right. even in a global pandemic, in theory. I mean, maybe you don't have the the most dynamic equipment in terms of the aerodyne bikes and whatever else, but uh, you can get outside and certainly do road work. So I think a lot of fighters will try to control what they can control, and that's the conditioning. Some of the skills might not be as sharp or as tuned up because it's hard to get live sparring. I think selectively you're noticing guys like Aljamain Sterling have a body or two that is clean, that they've been with sort of throughout, like Marab Dwalish Willie, and, right. and they've aligned and been able to stay working together. But it's hard, man, in terms of getting medicals done and everything else. It is a, a really weird climate for any profession, I think, certainly for professional athlete. And I think that gets taken up a degree when you talk about weight cutting professional fighters dealing with the coronavirus. It's nuts, man. The other thing, you know, they're going to, you know, let's take UFC 249. I'll forget about any shows that may be at Apex or whatever, but let's just say UFC 249. Obviously, ESPN and the UFC are going to have a vested interest in selling and promoting that show. So now they're going to have to have the fighters do media. And normally you have, you know, open workouts, you have, you know, ultimate fight um, and media day and that type of thing. And the media comes to the fighters. Now, all right. of a sudden, you may have the fighters have to go to the media and make phone calls. And it's going to take up a lot more of their time. Uh, and I just wonder, like, what impact that's going to have on people. 
No, it's all fair and it's all reasonable and it's a real reality for someone like Khabib Nurmagomedov thinking about devoting a day and a half in Russia, staring into a computer right now, talking to guys like you and me. So there's no doubt about it that uh, that is another layer to this that probably hasn't been talked about enough without a destination and a city. There hasn't been as much pay-per-view promotion. You got to think that's going to come pretty soon, right. Kev. I know Dana has mentioned he has three or four international possibilities and some domestic options as well. So I think once a location is determined, then some of that stuff will start to fall into place. But it's going to be pedal to the metal, man, trying to uh, to make up for lost time. It's just crazy to me that this fight is of such a singular importance uh, that there is such an urgency to put it on somehow, some way, even given this coronavirus backdrop. And uh, I'm betting on Dana White somehow, some way, I think, you know, however many days from now, 22 days from now, we're going to be looking at those two somehow, some way in an octagon. Yeah, we're recording this on uh, Friday the 27th, so it's going to uh, come out a, a little bit after that. So, you know, Dana, by that point, may have announced the location, so right. we, we don't know that. He told me the other day when I interviewed him that he would know the uh, location this week. So, you know, you would think today might be the deadline uh, yeah. to, to get to get that out. You know, my sense is Abu Dhabi is going to be where it's going to be, you know, just because the, uh, the Emirates and uh, the, the royal family is close with the UFC. They uh, used to own uh, part of the company and I, right. it, it's been shut down for a long time i just wonder getting people there and i saw a story the other day um russia shut down private and commercial planes and habib went back to russia so now like you know dana is going to have to figure out a way to get habib out of russia no matter where he's going but certainly yeah. get to get him to uh, uh to the emirates if that's where the fight would be if there's any machine that can make this happen, it is the UFC machine. And I remember when I got hired in 2011, I said, this is such a well-oiled machine, I'm just going to try to not get in the way. Right. And I have been increasingly in awe of that machine over the years. So if any team of executives can do it, it's the UFC. But, Kev, these are some unforeseen, craziest, unimaginable circumstances. Just take one fighter and – he wants to, with stakes this high, have all four of his corner men, right, be on an optimal schedule for cutting weight and everything else. I just think it's – I have a real sensitivity to the stakes of this fight. Right. A little different in the heavyweight division, but this fight is so important. I mean, Tony Ferguson, he wins this fight. He could be considered the greatest lightweight of all time for sure. Yeah. So uh, I just I, – I don't know, man. It's crazy to think that these two could be competing in an empty arena, but uh, – that's our reality. It is wild. I, I want to ask you about Habib because I, I find him such a fascinating guy. I mean, obviously, everybody sees his talent. He's, uh, what is he, 28 and 0, and, you know, pretty much uh, will fight anybody. I mean, his performance against Conor McGregor, if there were any doubts about him, is can he stand, do the stand up and handle the stand up? And I thought he showed he was quicker than Conor, at least yeah. on, on that particular night. And his hands were good enough that with his grappling, you know, he, he, he's just fearsome in all aspects of the game. But he has really become a major star, and I think he's grown into that as a personality. Uh, I had a chance to talk to him. Ali Abdelaziz had a media day right before uh, UFC uh, 248, and it was incredible to see the presence that he had that he didn't always yeah. have. And I wonder from your side, uh, do, do you see that? Do you see the growth of Habib? And you get the sense that, you know, I, I think he might have surpassed, say, Ronda Rousey and, and be second wow. only to Conor in terms of the biggest stars the UFC's had. I think you nailed it and settled on that word presence because there is an undeniable presence that wasn't necessarily there even three or four years ago. I made my debut call in fights the same night he made his UFC debut, January 20th, 2012, and he was largely a grappler and a wrestler. And when you think about a guy like that as disciplined and as dedicated and as smart and as thoughtful and as determined, He's been striking for eight or nine years now. You know, Javier Mendez will tell you he's going southpaw in training and looking right. pretty good doing it, you know? So I don't know that we should be surprised to see some striking evolution, certainly in terms of the persona and his mastery is a strong word, but his ability to connect in the English language and to do interviews in English. It's a hard transition for a lot of Brazilians, for a lot of Russians in particular. The fact that he's been able to do that has certainly helped him take it to the next level, but he stayed true to who he is, and he's always been that real article. He's not going to step out of his lane or step out of character. There was that outlier, obviously, the brawl in Las Vegas, but by and large, he's done it his way, Frank Sinatra style, and has still been able to resonate with people around the world despite not having a style bender type personality. So uh, I'm all in on Habib. I'm happy he's gotten his credit, and I think above all else, my thesis statement on Habib 
is that he wants to fight the best guys in the world. So when he's feet up in retirement, he looks back at a legacy that has all the great lightweights. And that's why four or five times he's wanted to fight Tony. Yeah, the, and uh, that that fight is just going to be off the hook crazy. You know, the thing about Habib uh, that gets me is that he is a really thoughtful guy. Like, you know, I, I saw he posted on Instagram um, yesterday. Uh, he said something, health is most important. So think about him, what he just said there. You know, he's talking about this is the fight of his life. I think even bigger than the Conor fight. You know, he's now at the top. He's the hunted at this point. And right. he's saying, hey, you know what? Health is most important. And if it's not safe for us, you know, he didn't come out and say it in so many words, but he said health is most important. And I think, you know, the fact that he now has a voice that he speaks out and says what he believes, uh, you know, really, really is commendable. And, and he's gone into a totally foreign culture and made himself a big celebrity. And of course, you know, he's the biggest in the Middle East and in the Muslim right. world, but he certainly is extraordinarily popular here. And, you know, he, he played a big role in that fight with Connor doing you know, over 2 yep. million pay-per-view buys. And he speaks to so many people. It's such a huge audience and it certainly got a McGregor boost, but it was well on its way. Uh, and you could certainly look at any metric that would tell you that. I just believe that going into a fight like this, for Tony and Khabib, it's just got to be so difficult, Kev, because they understand the fans' appetite for this fight and the fact that it's been put together five times. And so they want to fight through a global pandemic. And that certainly echoes the sentiments of a lot of fighters out there. And I feel like fighters have a, an obligation not just to family but to fans. And so I feel like both of those athletes are, have been put in a really difficult position. But as yet, if they're both willing to travel, uh, it seems like this fight's going to go on, even though we can line up the reasons why it shouldn't and it couldn't and it wouldn't. But uh, I don't know. ABD always bet on Dana. I'm telling you. you yeah, know? no, I would agree with you on that. You know, um, Tony Ferguson, you look at the, his body of work and all you have to do to know how successful he's been is look at the faces of the guys after he fights them. Oh. Have you, you know, Francis Ngannou might be the only fighter that I could say that I can think of who's scarier really than Tony Ferguson. I mean, what he does to guys, and sometimes I don't know the guys are the same after they fight him. I mean, you know, he he, he reminds me of some of those old-time boxers where, you know, you didn't necessarily knock him out, but they beat you so bad that you couldn't come back or you were never, you were a shell of yourself afterwards. And, and, and Tony is that kind of guy. Do you see that? A hundred percent. I I feel like he doesn't get enough credit for being the first guy at 155 pounds to put together a double-digit winning streak. Historically, the best UFC division. Yeah. This was the first guy to put that on paper. So I want to start there. But absolutely, I think you're onto something. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about that as sort of a trend. You know, you fight Tony Ferguson and you live to tell about it, but you're not necessarily the same athlete. And, you know, a lot of fighters trot out and it sounds trite, the phrase, you know, willing to die in there. But Tony Ferguson is that in a nutshell. I mean, Kenny right. Florian is always banging that drum, just not the tapping type. You know, he's certainly not going to tap in there. And I do believe it's a mental and a physical toughness that the average man or woman can't necessarily relate to. And I do believe when you have that type of dog in you, uh, it can eliminate some nerves, but it really makes you a special puzzle and recipe on fight night. Gregor Gillespie, lightweight contender, will tell you Ferguson's the toughest matchup for him because you really don't know what you're going to get. And even though you think your double leg might be successful, um, how are you going to try to keep him there? How are you going to minimize damage on the ground? Where is he attacking you from the bottom? And then when we get back to the feet, uh, who knows which limb and what part of that limb is coming your way? So truly a special fighter. And I think he he maybe doesn't have that signature win, right? I mean, the Kevin Lee win, obviously, for the interim belt is there, and the Pettis win. Cowboy sure. Cerrone. So Cerrone. Um, but this win would do so much for Tony. I don't know that one UFC win would have ever done as much for one athlete as it could do for Tony because it extends the winning streak. It sends Khabib to 28-1. and one. It sets up a second fight against somebody of Khabib's ilk and, uh, you know, punches Tony's ticket to the Hall of Fame. So... I can understand why Ferguson wants this fight to happen in the worst way here. You know, th this fight in a way reminds me of a boxing match, Pacquiao versus Mayweather, that did $4.6 million on pay-per-view. And I don't know that we get $4.6 million on pay-per-view if this fight happens simply because of the craziness going on. But let's pretend we're in an alternate uh, universe right now and everything is normal in the world. Yeah. And uh, we're going into April 18th, so now we're, you know, three weeks away from that fight. Dana talks about Connor versus uh, Habib too being the biggest fight of all time. Do you, do you think that the, 
if we had been in a normal time frame that Tony versus Habib might have been able to do that because, you know, of, of just the presence both these guys have and the body of work that they have. Do you think that that could have gotten people so jazzed up we might have seen that set some kind of record? Quite possibly. Uh, I don't know what the internal metrics say about Tony Ferguson and his ability to move certain needles that help push a big pay-per-view number. And I would preface everything I say by saying that Kevin Ioli is the far better pay-per-view predictor among this group. Um, but what type of number does Khabib do on his own? You know, I've always said Nate Diaz can push a pay-per-view number on his own. I don't know that it matters who Nate Diaz right. is facing. Obviously, if, if it's a trilogy fight against Conor McGregor, it brings everybody out. But what can Khabib do on his own? And I think it's a pretty special number. Now we have this crazy once a century type circumstance, right. hopefully, right? Hopefully we're not dealing with this in the winter and next spring as well. But, you know, this totally unforeseen circumstance that has relegated everybody home and chomping at the bit for any sort of live sporting event to such an extent. I don't know that how that doesn't push some sort of number you know i know the brazilian number a few weeks ago on free tv wasn't huge but uh well actually it was, be it was better let me tell you this so I'll, i don't mean to interrupt you john i i was on vacation i was supposed to be in hawaii uh, after that show and i was on vacation uh but then you know couldn't go to hawaii because of the virus so i texted dana and i had seen the uh the tv number i think it was six hundred seventy one thousand. i said yeah kind of disappointing he says my friend you missed what i told you and then it turned out that the fight was also on ESPN Plus, and they had a huge number on ESPN Plus. So when you put it together, it was actually more than what would have been on TV at the time had had right. it been at a normal period of time. So right. I, it did, did pretty good. So now that almost makes you wonder what happens on pay-per-view because there's no other sports going on if this fight happens. Oh, know. yeah. So that no, could be crazy. No, it's exciting. And when you parlay that with, what we expect this fight card could be. I mean, Francis Ngannou's trainer out there intimating that maybe he could be in the co-main event or at least on that fight and card. And Francis so, himself uh, noted that now, so. So, and there are, there are a lot of huge fights and a lot of fighters that want to fight. Leon Edwards wants to fight. Hopefully that Woodley Edwards fight happens here in the not-too-distant future. I think you could get a triple-header type old-school fight card. Oh, here my on God, April that would be crazy. You're looking at, you know, three main events and... uh you know, I'll call it from an edit trailer in the back, Kevin. <laughs> I call those Don King cards because back in the day when Don King was at his peak promoting, I, I covered fights at the MGM Grand where there was like six title fights out of 14 fights on a card. And you had world title fights. Ricardo Lopez, one of the greatest fighters of all time, fighting at 5 o'clock on a pay-per-view. I yeah, mean, it was right. just crazy. Yeah. So those are yeah, Don King it. cards. Yeah. So uh, I, I really think it's going to be interesting to see – to what extent they can blow this out, right? I do believe a lot of it's going to come down to medicals, and that's not informed speculation. It's just if you think about every individual fighter right. case, which fighters in which matchup can get their medicals done in whatever fighting climate or jurisdiction. And once that happens, however many fights it is, uh, you know, we'll be ready to work them and hopefully bring them to the world. John, I won't keep you much longer, but I want to touch on Francis Ngannou just as uh, as his career and as a fighter. I mean, when he fought Stipe, I, I don't think there was a bigger disappointment than his performance that night. Stipe fought great, and let's give Stipe credit for the way he fought against Francis, but it was almost like Francis had no idea how to get up off the ground, as if he thought Stipe wouldn't try to wrestle him, and I'm like, duh. Um, right. But then he comes back against uh, Cain Velasquez. Uh, and, well, when she even said he had the stinker against Derek Lewis, right? So there was kind of like, what's going on with yeah. this guy? But it seems like the old Francis is back. Uh, what do you expect of Francis going forward? And do you think he's the guy that could do for the UFC what Mike Tyson did for boxing in terms of, you know, uh, not only the power, but the persona and bring, bring that, you know, craziness to uh, the sport? Absolutely. Scariest heavyweight in the world at present. He would be favored right now to beat every heavyweight on the roster. He'd be favored, in my opinion, in a rematch against Stipe. People might think that's crazy, but there's been a lot of time for evolution. I also did take some good out of those 25 minutes, Kev, as crazy as that might sound. Just the fact that he didn't get cut up. He didn't get finished. He didn't lose his heart or his toughness in there. He was able to survive those 25 minutes at a pretty developmental stage of his career. So uh, certainly I'm buying stock in Francis Ngannou. I think most guys would say right now he's the guy they would least like to fight. Even a guy like Daniel Cormier, who would appear to have a path of least resistance that is very clear stylistically, right. I don't think wants anything to do with Francis Ngannou at 41 years old or otherwise. Right. So uh, 
Very excited to see what he can do against Jarzinho Rosenstrike. And we got to inject Rosenstrike into the conversation a little bit because he is asking for the fight that nobody's burning Nobody up else is that. asking. So, uh, but yes, I couldn't be higher on Francis Ngannou. I would be absolutely stunned if at one point we do not see UFC President Dana White wrapping a shiny gold belt around his waist. I have to think so, too. I mean, because he has so many uh, physical skills. And, and for a guy that's as big as he is, I, I, I mean, why I always thought Stipe was going to be such a big factor is he's such a good athlete. And now I look at Francis, and I think Francis is that, like, next evolution. You know, he, he looks like, I mean, I don't think this is a stretch to say he could be a defensive end in the NFL. I mean, you know, oh, you no. bulk him up a little bit, and, I mean, he's going to be an all-pro defensive end. And I always think, you know, and I, it's fun to do talk about other athletes coming in there. What would LeBron James be like if he was a UFC heavyweight? But I think what, what would Francis Ngannou do if, you know, hey, he had learned football years ago? I mean, he'd be, uh, he'd be getting 20 sacks a year. I wonder how long it would take, you know, how many months? I mean, would it be 72 months? How, how many months would it really take to try to get Francis Ngannou in position to maximize an NFL tryout, right? right. Because he's going to have – he'll win some one-on-one -on -one exchanges, I can assure you, with some very big men. I think you're onto something there, but I, I think we're all thankful he chose uh, the UFC for that. And I, I'm going to make two examples of that that I think, you know, people mock, you know, Michael Jordan being the first. People mock Michael Jordan's double-A baseball. And, and I, I think the people who mock it show their ignorance and they don't understand how good double-A baseball is. That right. is where the absolute best prospects are. And Michael Jordan, you know, stole, what did he steal, 30 bases and hit. You know, I mean, his batting average was low, but he, he had good numbers. And he hadn't played baseball in, what, 15 or 16 right. years. of course. And the other thing was Brock Lesnar when he put, went to the Vikings. I mean, here's a guy that never played football, basically, right? And he goes, and after a wrestling career at the University of Minnesota and in being in the WWF, he now goes and, and, and he almost made the Vikings at one point. And right. so I, I think those are those kind of special athletes. I think Francis, not Michael Jordan level, but certainly a Brock Lesnar level athlete. Absolutely. And he has physical gifts that Brock Lesnar doesn't have. Like Lesnar has a big UFC glove because his hand is big top to bottom. But Brock Lesnar doesn't have huge mitts. Francis Ngannou has huge hands that would be huge assets on an NFL line of scrimmage. You know, Brock Lesnar has certain as crazy as it sounds. Hopefully Brock isn't watching Yahoo Sports, but Brock has some physical limitations that Francis Ngannou simply doesn't have, you right. know? So, uh, no, absolutely. He's a special, special guy. And uh, I do think for him, in terms of taking that requisite next step with his celebrity and superstardom, it might be aligned with the belt you know, uh, in breaking through and winning the title. But I do believe that if he beats Rosenstrike here, and hopefully that fight happens April 18th, uh, he's going to be next in line, and that's a scary proposition for Stipe or anybody else. And can you believe, speaking of Rosenstrike, that Alistair Overeem is going to fight again after what happened to him against Rosenstrike at the end of that fight? I mean, when you saw the picture of Overeem's uh, lip and everything, you had to think, well, this guy has done for a long time, and he's back and ready to go masterful plastic surgery to save the ream's face you know it's a pretty good looking guy and uh live to tell about that one that's as again when you talk about sitting calling ufc fights watching ufc fights from a journalistic perspective it's the theater of the unknown right yeah. it's the most incredible theater there is with a few seconds to go in a heavyweight main event that left a lot to be desired all of a sudden the narrative becomes a guy's lip is literally split coast to coast and uh Gave us plenty to talk about, as this sport, you know, so often does. John, I want to ask you this. Uh, you know, Daniel Cormier gets a little exuberant when stuff happens in the octagon, and sometimes he jumps up. Have you ever gotten comped and said, my God, this guy can punch hard by him falling back and, uh, and getting so excited about a KO? Thankfully, I usually have Rogan between us now, but DC's big on the physical contact. So is Joe, you know. It's almost like he's trying to save lives when something crazy happens. You know, when Kevin Lee knocked out Gregor Gillespie oh my God. right in front of us. and. It's not always right in front of us because we watch the monitors a lot of the times because that is what's being translated to the home audience. Right. So I want my commentary to dovetail with what is on TV. So we're not always watching the octagon right in front of us. This literally looked like a man died in front of us. And so Joe is almost like trying to, to save his broadcast partners by making contact. But uh, crazy sport, man. You know, I mean, basketball is crazy, too, but uh, you just don't get that type of uh, dynamic on the hardwood. I'll wrap it up, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask uh, Boston boy John Anik, uh, are you heartbroken right now to see uh, Mr. Tom Brady going to be wearing <laughs> pewter? And what, what are the colors uh, they call? I, I don't even know what they call those colors, but Tom Brady is a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. J.A., I saw you posted a photo on social media of you and uh, Tom Brady. Um, what, what's it like as a, a Patriots fan to see that? 
So you're wearing Tampa Bay Buccaneers old school colors today for our interview. The Las Vegas play. Paiute Golf Course here. I have played that track not as as seamlessly and as well as you play it, but uh, I love those KI Instagram golf videos. But no, so Tom Brady. So I went to the Super Bowl that they won against the Rams a couple years ago, the last Belichick Brady Super Bowl. I was a season ticket holder in the '80s when they were the laughing stock of the NFL. It's been 20 years. I am in the minority of, of New England Patriots fans that is excited to see what Belichick can do without Brady and vice versa. I I think Tom wanted a clean break and wanted to get some adoration from another franchise and see what he could do in the NFC with sort of a, a reset button. And uh, I, I'm excited to see what they can do. I'm excited to see if the Patriots can open up the playbook a little bit with a quarterback that has a little bit of mobility. Eternally grateful for Tom's contributions and all the joy that he's brought my mother and everybody else in our family. But uh I don't know, man. I'm just not losing sleep over it the way my twin brother and a lot of people out there are. You know, yeah, they they are going. People are going crazy. Dana was really heartbroken over yeah. that. I mean, I and I saw he posted a thing. Um, it was funny, you know. Hey, thanks for 20 great years in Brady Road. Thanks, Dana. You're a great friend. So the two of them have a special relationship. Yeah, Tom's did, a big UFC fan, like legitimately into it. I thought, you know, that day that he was at the event and Mark Davis was sitting there, I thought, boy, this is a sign and we're going to see him playing in Las Vegas for the Raiders. So I was expecting that announcement, even though, you know, I, I don't follow football anymore as a diehard Steelers fan. Once I saw the movie Concussion, I thought, you know, and, and, and just to say to you, so people don't think I'm a hypocrite, I cover fighting. Why are you upset at the NFL because of concussions? Because when you fight, everybody knows the risk. When you, the NFL hid the risk from fighters, they knew yeah. that there was a, a risk of brain damage and, and these things going on, and they hid it for so long. And that movie, I thought, expertly uh, played it out. So I don't get, I still read about the NFL, and I love, right. uh, like, sure. I, I can never lose my love for the Steelers. I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, and I, you see behind me, I have my Steelers yep. thing up there. Um, and I have up here, I have all my signed things, Jack Lambert, Joe, my Joe Green. Yes. I, have my, I have my dog's name. I have one dog named after Joe do. Green, another one named after Sidney Crosby. I'm a Pittsburgh guy, but I don't watch the NFL anymore because of that, right? So that, that, was, my, uh, that was my thing. But I just cannot imagine an iconic franchise player like Tom Brady ever leaving. When I thought he was coming to Las Vegas, I thought this would be something to see. Yeah. It seemed to me that his oldest son, who I think he had with Bridget Moynihan, is in school in New York, and that seemed to be the most valuable piece of information when trying to figure out where he was going to go, that he had an East Coast-based kid, so I was thinking Eastern Standard Time Zone for Tom, but I hear you on the NFL. Like, I call mixed martial arts fights for a living, and right. when I watch the collisions in rugby uh, and the NFL— uh, it's really hard for me to watch. You should see, you like my reactions calling UFC fights. You should see me on my couch watching the NFL. I'm like, oh God, you know? Yeah. And I'll tell you too, as a former boxing journalist, even watching that Wilder Fury undercard, my man. Oh. Uh, and I was there in 05 with you for the Levander Johnson passing. You know, I have a hard time watching a guy just get pummeled for 36 right. minutes and, and get a concussion. And as long as he can get back up in 10 seconds, I have a real hard time watching football and boxing, despite what I do for a living. Yeah, it's it's tough. Like, I, I have been ringside, John, for seven fighter deaths. Um, oh. And that is just the worst. One of the fighters actually fell on me. Um, and he got it. He rolled back in the ring, took the knee, took the 10 count. And then he collapsed in his dressing room later after I had left. And he died in surgery overnight. And, I mean, it was just, I mean, it was just an... I, every time I think of it, I just get chills and it just breaks my heart. And so I have so much respect for what these men and women do and how brave they are. And, you know, I, I may criticize the way they fight or whatever happens, but you know what? I never will ever, ever, ever say somebody is afraid because if you step and you walk up those three steps and you get in that cage or you get in that ring, you are a brave person and you have a lot of courage and I will never dog anybody for doing that. Amen to you for saying that perfectly put you know who's afraid me that's why i don't walk up those stairs kid you, you know? walk up to talk to him after it's all done <laughs> right yeah that's right right my credential says i can go in the octagon to interview him but uh yeah i'll keep my shirt on sounds good my man i appreciate you john it's been great i kept you way longer than i said but uh, this all is good, awesome stuff i really appreciate you so much thank you john and uh, congratulations on a brilliant career Oh, pleasure, buddy. Always good to talk to you and see you in these uh, uncertain times. Wish you all the best. See you soon on the road, hopefully, man. Look forward to it.